26th of February 2015. Spurs played two high-profile games within the space of a few days. Fiorentina, then Chelsea. Pochettino makes big changes in the first, favouring the second game. Spurs end up winning neither. Deja vu, anyone? This is your eSpurs podcast. Come on, you Spurs! Come on, you Spurs! Welcome to the podcast, guys, your weekly fix of THFC chat and debate. Um, Don't forget, we want you to get in touch and stay in touch with the show. If you like what you hear or just want to have your say on anything that's said tonight, there's multiple ways to stay in touch with all things eSpurs. We're on Twitter at E underscore Spurs, on Facebook, which is forward slash eSpurs page. And new for this season, you can get in touch with us and follow us on Google Plus and YouTube. For all the links to the eSpurs platform, just go to our website, which is www.espurs.blogspot.co.uk. Tonight, we'll look back at a week which promised so much but delivered so little. I'll be getting the team's thoughts on our lack of transfer activity so far, and in particular, that of a new striker. And we'll get your thoughts on this week's talking point, uh, which is what Spurs goal do you remember celebrating most and why? So hopefully, a nice antidote to what's sure to be a fairly passionate podcast this week week I think it's fair to say but before we get into the podcast let's introduce the panel of Spurs fans who make up the East Spurs team as always it's Jason John and Ricky how you doing fellas all good all right mate thanks very well thank you Andy good stuff lads good to have you on as always and as I say I'm sure it's going to be a passionate one tonight after a fairly tricky week I think it's fair to say um stirred up a few emotions I know the the pre-podcast chat that we've just had could have filled up a few podcasts so uh on with the podcast guys and as I say a difficult week two games um since we last recorded both against Leicester. The last podcast we recorded was was pretty optimistic, I think it's fair to say, um, because we were at a good point then. Um, things were looking bright, and it's just stuttered, hasn't it, I think, is the uh, the word to use. It's, it's just not gone our way over the last two games. Many, many reasons why. I know Twitter last night was, was ablaze with pointing fingers and um, who's to blame, and um, we've had a good chat about that also. So let's get the boys' thoughts on the Leicester games. I'll tell you what, we'll start with the Leicester Cup game, lads, if we can. Thinking back to last weekend, six changes in the lineup, which some people were surprised by. Went with Son, Anoma, Chadley, Rose, Carroll, Vimmer. So six changes, big, big changes in that game. Let's start with, I'll tell you what, let's go to Ricky first up. Rick, was six changes too many for the Cup game? <sighs> I mean, you know how I feel about the FA Cup, Andy, like I said to you, I feel we should always be treating the Cup competitions very, very seriously. Having said that, I understand why he made the changes he did. I think the one that everybody feared in the Cup game was possibly the return of Fazio, which thankfully didn't occur. Um, In terms of the centre-back pairing, I can't say I disagree with that. Um, I was happy to see Vimmer come in. I thought we'd done an excellent job alongside... Um, Toby Alderweireld. I thought they played very, very well together. Again, the fullback change is what we expected. He does it in the Europa League, so that was fully expected on my behalf. I can't say that I was too concerned about the team, bearing in mind that I knew, obviously, ahead of it, Leicester were going to make also make the changes. I mean, from Leicester's perspective, they've had a fantastic season in the league, and that was before last night. So. Again, both teams were anticipating that each other were going to make changes. So I could understand why he made the changes he did. In terms of the game itself, um, thinking back now, it seems such a long time ago, but I was there. I thought we started the game quite well. We got the early goal, which was crucial. And then, same as last night, so frustrating, we were undone by a set piece. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, corners seem to be a bit of a weakness for us. I don't really know why. Um, It seems that, from what Pochettino says, that we seem to go with the kind of zonal marking as opposed to -to man-to-man. But it obviously is a problem for us because it was such a poor goal to concede to allow Leicester back into the game. And then I just thought the game itself didn't ever really kind of settle down. Second half, Leicester go in front. And again, we're throwing everything at the game. And we have to be honest and say that with the skin of our teeth, we got a penalty, which in hindsight, you could argue, we were very, very lucky to get and we stayed in the cup by the skin of our teeth. Now, Kane, who got the penalty, I mean, 
you can see the guy, he just looks absolutely knackered. And that was before the game last night. So we got out of jail in terms of getting the penalty, scoring the penalty and staying in the cup. Um, but I think maybe you could argue that too many changes was made. If I was in his position, I have to say I would have favouredly done the same. I don't think the lineup he picked was ridiculous. Um, I think the players that he brought in were more than capable enough of winning the game based on the selection that Leicester had. And thankfully, we're still in the cup. And I still believe we can go away to Leicester and get a positive result because they're also going to make changes. And for me, for me personally, you know how I, how I feel about the FA Cup. I want us to go as far as possible. Yeah, absolutely, Rick. I mean, you took the words out of my mouth there. We spoke about the Cup last week on the podcast, didn't we, and how important it is to the history of Spurs. And although it's not, you know, nowadays seen as such a glamorous trophy to win, it's it's a it's a major trophy, isn't it, still? And it's it's part of our, the fabric of our club. It's a strange one. Jace, as I mentioned there, six changes to the lineup. Was that showing the, the Cup the prestige it deserves, do you think? I don't think it is because... Um... But I, you know, almost every single Premier League club did the same thing, didn't they? With the with the Premier League games on Wednesday, I think you know the vast majority of sides. You had Swansea going making eight, nine, ten changes. You had West Ham was making changes. You had Norwich City's making changes. So you know, unfortunately, that is the way of the FA Cup. And, and you're right. I think it's an age thing, whereas perhaps the 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 over thirties or people that have have got big footballing memories before the Premier League era started, we all understand what the FA Cup is. Yeah. We all remember listening on Monday morning to the to the cup draw with the little velvet bag over the over Radio Two, and we remember seeing it's a cup final knockout day, don't we? Um, yeah. and, and it was an era where about the only game on TV that was genuinely live was the cup final, and it it didn't matter who the cup final was, every football fan stayed in and watched the cup final, and we grew up with it. In, in in that respect but unfortunately we've reached an age now where where everyone just talks about Premier League football and the race for the top four and that's the it's just an age thing I think but you know I mean in terms of the side that we picked when you're bringing in Chadley's uh, and, and players like that and we're still bringing in what I would call his first team players and, and those first team players do need to be playing to be made to feel part of the squad mm. so I didn't so much have a problem with the with the line up uh, bearing in mind that we knew that Leicester would, but the one thing is the the second striker. If you don't have that second striker, then then you're always going to leave yourself vulnerable at that end of the pitch. And, and we saw, didn't we, that Son is an attacking midfield player. He's not a striker. He has no presence up there. It's very different when you've you've got to play a little bit of the game with your back to goal and having the ball coming to you rather than being able to run onto the ball. And Son sees everything in front of him, not what's behind him. And and that's that's not a criticism of him, but it's just a fact that you know we we shut ourselves in the foot by not being able to have that genuine striker on the pitch through the ninety minutes. Yeah, and we'll come obviously, you know, big talking point for later on in the show is Jace, with regards to the lineup, the thing I struggle to understand, if you like, is the fact that he seems to have played a stronger side in the Europa League group stage than he does in the third round of the FA Cup against one of the best teams in the country at the moment. It, to me, it seems to make no sense. It seems to say that it doesn't rate the FA Cup as seriously as, as maybe the Europa League, if you like. I think that that's that quite possibly is true, unfortunately. Um, but then the Europa League carries with it a Champions League place, mm. and, and you know this seems to be the holy grail now for any club is is Premier League points, top four, and that Champions League. And we can sit here and moan and groan about it and, and talk about the game is about glory and use all those familiar phrases to us. But unfortunately, and, I, and I'd be on that and on the same wavelength as all of us. I want us to go and win trophies. To me, that's what it is about. Not finishing top four, but when you've got a, a new stadium to finance and you've got you know, the, the riches that go with it. And I understand the point of view that people say, as a club, to be seen to be moving in the right direction of a club, you've got to now be in the top four to attract the players to help you push on. So it's, it's you know, I, I can see both sides of the argument. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. And um, for the replay, I, I think we've got a great chance. When you look at the draw of the cup, lads, I mean, there is a great chance there. We've got, should we beat Leicester? You've got Colchester away, which, you know, it's not White Hart Lane, but it's not the toughest tie that we could have drawn. So I would personally go out with a bit stronger side in the replay against Leicester because get through and you're potentially looking at, a, you know, maybe a quarter final spot. So 
we'll see what he does. Um, John, regards to the, the Leicester game, Ericsson back on the score sheet. It was good to see him get back in, in the goals, wasn't it? Because he's a player in recent weeks who we've we've had some concerns about. It was good to see him finish that one off. Yeah, it was. I think he took it quite sharply as well. It he come back to him quite quickly and he managed to pick out the bottom corner. Yeah, it was a decent finish, but... I think he, he did. He flitted in and out of the cup game, and again last night, obviously got taken off. He didn't. He didn't really kick on from that goal. You know, you would think he'd get a bit more confident, maybe in his play after after finding the net, and but it didn't really happen. But I just going back to what the boys have just said. I, I still believe, and I said this for a few years now. The the thing that's killing the FA Cup is the FA itself, mm. and what I mean by that is they got no problem scheduling Premier League games four days after. But we have to have a couple of international friendlies to boost their coffers where we could play Premier League games instead. And they know that they know that the FA Cup is not taken as seriously as it used to be. One maybe because the influx of foreign managers in the league. I know they are, you know, they're not they're not idiots, they understand the FA Cup and stuff, but it would probably mean less to someone like it did to Nigel Clough, uh, sorry, Brian Clough, or more more recently uh, people like Ferguson and Harry Redknapp and people like that. That, you know, I think that was the only major trophy Harry Redknapp won with Portsmouth, and I think that'd mean more to him than anything else, purely because he's English. I, I think. Yeah. I, I understand why he's done it because managers are not going to get sacked because they go out in the third round of the cup, but they will get sacked if they finish below fifth in the league. Yeah. And I understand why he prioritises it. You know, looking at he's probably looking after his family in that sense as much as he's looking after the club. Yeah, yeah, it's great, great point, valid point. And, um, you know, we, as, as Jace mentioned, we, it's not specific to Spurs. We saw it across the country. Every team put out a, a, a weakened side, if you like. My, my point would be, I think most Spurs fans would accept putting out two or three changes to the lineup. But when you put six, you're, you, you know, you're ripping the heart out of the team. And I think the, the one that worried me the most is, and I, don't get me wrong, I love Danny Rose, but to have, we didn't need for him to be the captain because Hugo Lloris can play. Yeah. Right. Mich- as far as I'm concerned, Michelle Vaughan knew full well when he signed, you're number two, without any shadow of a doubt. Don't start thinking you're going to play too often because you're not. And he must have known that when he signed, right? Yeah. We've got one of the best goalkeepers in the world, I would most would agree, in our team. He can play 50 games a season, Hugo, and he seems to me the kind of bloke that won't, won't want to rest. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he came back and he, he, he looked sharp last night and he, he probably didn't need to, to miss a game. But that, that that's the one that worried me the most. Like Ricky said, with Vimmer coming in, I was quite happy with that. He looks like a good young player. And all the other guys, you know, they deserve a chance because, as we said before, it's 4 2 3 1 and it's the same 11 more or less every week. So to give the other players a chance who are part of the first team squad, you know, they do need to play. But it's when you start delving too deep into the squad. I think like Liverpool did against Exeter, that's when you're asking for trouble. We're a bit, we, I can't see him putting anything other than a full 11 out next week in the replay. And hopefully we'll have Colchester away to look forward to. Yeah, that's that's it, mate. And as I say, it's a great, great chance you've then got to get you know further on in the competition. Um, Rick, the penalty given in, in the game, a lot of controversy over it at the time because of how close the ball was to hand um, before he, he touched it. Was it a pen for you? Oh, well, it's one of those where, um, <laughs> having watched it initially the first time, I didn't think it was a penalty. But then the more I watch it, I mean, in fairness, having, I think it's uh, Dyer's arm touch the ball, it does, the ball moves position, it, the ball moves, you know, so it does evade where the ball was going. So on that basis, you would say it's a penalty. <sighs> on the other side of things, you would maybe say that the player... Because he was looking the other way, he couldn't get, he couldn't move his hand out of the way to collide with the ball. So, listen, I still believe we got very, very lucky on the penalty. Um, the game itself, we're lucky to be in the cup. And sometimes, as we know, you need a bit of luck in the cup. You need a bit of luck. And maybe that could be a good omen for us. Because, like we've all said, we want to see us go as far as we can in the cups. You know, it's important to us. I've always said, look, Champions League it's fantastic but it doesn't it's not the same as winning a trophy it's not the same as a day out at Wembley no one remembers you for finishing the top four people remember you for trophies at the end of your career as a player what you're going to be asked how many times did you get in the top four or how many trophies did you win I think the second question applies yeah, absolutely. You can't, I mean, you can't put a top four place in the trophy cabinet, can you? But it goes in the uh, fits quite nicely into the bank balance for for the chairman. So uh, I think there's your answer, isn't it, mate? I think, game, I think uh, just on just on that, I think as well, it's worth pointing out though that you know if if you think of of the really big 
glory, glory nights mm. that we've had in recent years. Do you remember us beating Inter Milan in the Champions League? Do we remember the bow hat trick? Do we remember the, the AC Milan game where, where Crouchy gets on the end of Lennon's? Or do we remember beating Burnley in an FA Cup tie? Or do we remember playing Leicester in an FA Cup yeah. tie? Yeah. You know, over, over the last five years, what are the nights that the new generation of fans are going to think, oh, I was glad I was at White Hart Lane to see that game. I can remember we, when we won the Cup, was it 81 or 82? Yeah when we played Exeter at home, it might have been the 82 season, I think, because I remember the new stand being built. And I think we played Exeter at home in round five. And White Hart Lane was absolutely packed. Mm. But if we had Exeter at home in the FA Cup this weekend, would it have been packed? <laughs> no. no. It just wouldn't have been. And, and that's the problem with it. It's become a... You're right, as you say, we sound like a dad. I mean, I, I almost did, because I thought we should have played with Jimmy Greaves up front last <laughs> night and, and played with Cliff Jones on the wing. So, you know, I was, I was thinking that way. But it, it's just a generation thing. And unfortunately, the football's become so much more business orientated that the business is now dictating the priorities of the club. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Everybody's got to survive, haven't they? And we've seen um, the likes of Leeds and, and other clubs. What happens if you don't think financially, I guess, in some respect? So you can understand that to a degree. Um, it's a really interesting debate. Maybe another talking point for another week. That's the talking point for next <laughs> week. Yep. There you go. Yeah, I did that one for you, Jace. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Lad, let's look at the, Le the Leicester game, the league game. Again, a game I think we all went into feeling really optimistic. Although Leicester are a damn good side this season, let's take nothing away from them. Um, we, we spoke before the podcast about Ranieri. I, I think Ranieri's got to be a shoe in for manager of the year. Personally, I can't see anybody who, who would come close to him this season. They, they've got a plan. They execute it down to a T, absolute T. Um, and they came to White Hart Lane and, and did a job on us, didn't they? Absolutely did a job on us. John, let's start with you, mate. Leicester in the league. Again, a game where it was looking so good and ended up in a night of frustration. I, don't, I can't really add much more to what you just said there, mate. I think you just summed it up. I mean, everyone's just gutted. As, you know, we all are gutted, but it did crack me up, I must say. I know I've got to make, some, make light of it somehow. <laughs> But the knee-jerk reaction, mate, honestly, more knee-jerking than Strictly Come Dancing on Twitter last <laughs> night. It was just cracking me up. Like it was, I put a tweet out, it's like Tim Sherwood and Vlad Kirikers and Paulinho have come back. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I understand everyone was frustrated by it. You know, we could have been a point behind them, I think. We're now, you know, a few more in behind. Uh, sorry, could have been just, yeah, could have been just one point. Now, obviously, the gap's bigger. Um and, but there's still 17 games to go. And I know I keep saying this, but I'm still expecting them to fall away. And I just think that, uh, I mean, all right, yeah, you, like you just said about Ranieri, I think the difference is between, as we saw last night, I believe, Pochettino is so stubborn. And I do think that it's it sometimes can harm him a little bit. Like in the transfer window, I think we're seeing. If he's saying often enough out loud to the press, I'm happy with the squad, we don't need another striker. Even though he deep down he knows we do, he's probably starting to believe what he's saying because either he's, I don't know he's trying to cover the chairman's arse or whatever. But the thing is with with Ranieri, I think he's with the same group of players that just about stayed up last year. I think what's happened is he's come in and he's decided right. Obviously, he can't play the way he played at Chelsea or at Valencia. I think he was before because he hasn't got the players to do that. So play to their strengths. And I think the thing is with Pochettino, he's very much the other way around. Whereas he's got his system. And either you've got to fit into it or you're gone. And I think, yeah, you're right in saying, you know, what Ranieri's done in six months at Leicester compared to 18 months that Pochettino's had at Tottenham. The difference is Poch has had to clear out so much crap from the squad, reduce the wage bill and all the rest of it. I think with Leicester, it couldn't have got any worse for them this season. You know what I mean? Yeah. It couldn't have been any worse. They would have been in the championship if it did. And I think the thing is with Tottenham as well, you know, the, the spotlight's there, the pressure's there. <clears throat> we're obviously a fickle bunch of fans as well, as last night's social media explosion showed. But yeah, I just, uh, I'm, you know, it's it's only one game. I'm sure we're going to bounce back on Saturday. I really, I, you know, if we play like we did last night on Saturday, we'll win comfortably. I just think it's one of them. Leicester are having a freak season. The league's been a bit of a freak all season, really. Even like, you know, you had Arsenal dropping points last night and Chelsea dropping more points, which was which cheered me up a bit. But I just think this is this is one game, right? Still only the third defeat. Jace, I don't want to know how many games we've won, right? We, we know. 
I can't remember a season where we've got to this point where that number's been so small, to be honest. And still, the defensive side of the game, although, unfortunately, Toby decided to rugby tackle Eric Dyer to the ground to allow Rob Hoof to score last night, we have been so much better in so many departments and in so many ways we have been so much better than last season. You know, I think we've we conceded about 482 goals by this point last season and we're going in the right direction and we are going to have blips and I just think that that's all last night was we had one against Man United first game went on a massive unbeaten run <clears throat> we had a blip against Newcastle smashed it for the next four or five games didn't lose and we'll do it again I'm sure we will and, you know in a month's time hopefully we would have uh, created a little bit more daylight between us and whoever's fifth or whoever's fourth hopefully by then we might be a bit higher up and uh, I'm sure this podcast is a one-off this week. We will be fine. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, the point you make there about the gap is, is really relevant because last night could have provided that, couldn't it? You know, at the stage where we were drawing, you're thinking, well, you know, it's not the best result. But having said that, Leicester aren't moving away from us. So it's it's not the worst result in the world. But then to go and, and lose it and lose it so late as we did, I think it was, it was such a sucker punch, wasn't it? But as I say, it was Leicester executing their plan down to a T. Jace, how do you go through a game dominating as much as we did and still yet come out as losers? Uh, that's that's a frustration, isn't it? Because you, you look at the two games together, we had 40, I think it's 46 shots at goal mm. and we had 25 corners over the two games. And yet, you know, as we said before the game, how many clear-cut chances over the both the games did we really create? Really, really clear-cut chances, like the one that that uh, Harry Kane had that ends up hitting the crossbar, which, you know, a little bit unlucky there that it doesn't go in. But, you know, it was those real, there was the, there was a ball across the face of the box that Lamella put over the bar, and we all saw Pochettino's reaction on the bench as if to say, come on, you've got to hit the target. But other than those couple of clear, what I call genuinely clear-cut chances, we never really got in and behind them and, and opened them up in the way that we, we need to do. And <laughs> it's interesting to see Jan's comments today, you know, complaining about how Leicester's tactics are, are, are terrible and they only do this. But at the end of the day, we've played them three times this year and haven't looked like beating them. So it's up to us to find a way to beat those tactics rather than, than simply moaning and groaning about them. A little bit of sour grapes in there, isn't there? You know, when, when you hear those comments. Rick, we mentioned that we failed to break Leicester down, but it's not just Leicester, is it? Time and time again this season, although we're, we're relatively having a, a decent season, it seems as if we get to the final third and then everything just, just trickles away, doesn't it? I, I mean, they almost run out of ideas. They look as if they're, they're scared to shoot in some senses. Jason's mentioned the stat there of the, the shots we've had and... Um, how, relative to how many we've actually had on target and it just seems as if at the moment we haven't got that player who can pick a lock and, and unlock a, a defence have we? No uh, I have to agree with you on that point Andy can I just say just want to on your point first Lee, you're exactly right 21 Premier League games we played nine, we only had 9 wins out of those 21 and 9 draws the draws are what is killing us at the moment um, along with the fact like we've said that in terms of game changes we just simply don't have one and I just fear that Ericsson despite his goal against Leicester in the cup his lack of form is what's harming us you have to go back to last season and I'm talking before he hit February onwards how many late goals did he get us how many times did he rescue us out of trouble to either get, us, to either get a point or get us all free where is that Ericsson from last season? Mm. Because it's the same manager. Nothing has changed from that perspective. But the guy is lacking form and it's killing us at the moment. Is there a lack of now, competition I'm, for him, do you think, Rick? Well, I think he knows. I think Ericsson knows that he's guaranteed his place every week. And the problem is, I think he's in the team purely because we know as fans, having watched him last season and the season before that, that he is capable of delivering. Why he's not delivering... That's another question. I don't know. But the problem you've got with Ericsson is that when he's not on the pitch, you fear thinking, why is he not playing? When he is on the pitch, he's not doing the job. So, again, I, you just have to keep hoping he'll come good. But based on last night, can I just say, I personally can't fault the team's application, effort, commitment. I don't think they could work harder. It's, I think one tweet summed up last night perfectly that the Tongan Alderville had Vardy and Mar is in their back pocket 
and it's typically Spursy we can see to a Robert Hoof goal. I mean, you just couldn't make it up. The fact that we kept Vardy Mares so quiet, and also the fact that in the second half there was, I think, five successive corners from Leicester that we defended superbly, cleared every ball. Eighty, you know, was it eighty-second minute? The Hoof header, like the boys have alluded to. I don't know what Dyer. And out of it, we're doing the rugby tackling each other. I, the the, the organisation there from a corner, bearing in mind you've got to remember on the Sunday, we've conceded from a corner as well. So we know how good they are at set pieces. That's such a frustration. And oh, it, it does feel last night, like I say, I'm agreeing with John here that I think, again, if you look at it from the defeats this season, it's only three defeats in 21. Yes, we've had you know a lot of draws, but have Spurs been in a better position in terms of where we are in the league this time where well, I'm saying in January for this, you know, in how many years? I don't think we have. I still think we've got a great chance of making the top four. We're still only seven points off the top. Arsenal still have to come to Spurs. Arsenal still have got tough away games. Yes, I might sound crazy talking about, you know, a league title challenge. But what I'm just trying to emphasise is that as frustrating as last night was, it is only, I think, a blip. Sunderland is a massive game for us. We have to bounce back. Um, this team have shown on previous occasions, back to the first day of the season, that when we suffer a defeat, we always respond well. Since that Newcastle defeat, we went on three straight wins. We were unbeaten in five. This team are different to what we've experienced before. They will find a way back. And we have to put last night down as a blip because in general, the performance, I don't think you could ask for more. But like you've alluded to, Andy, in terms of game changers, there's not. Look at the bench last night from an attacking perspective option who he can bring on. Dembele, Onoma and Son. Now Dembele, as good as he is, he wasn't fully fit last night. Otherwise, he would have started the game over Carroll. Onoma, he's a young kid from the reserves. He's not ready yet for the Premier League. And Son, as we've all discussed before, Son is not a recognised centre forward. So those that want to criticise Pochettino in terms of him not doing enough from a tactical perspective need to look at the bench. Is Levy selling him short? Is Levy selling us short? I believe he is. We are the fifth. We are now the 16th of January. We are still the only club in the league to only have one recognised striker. If we are serious about a top four challenge, for God's sake, pull your finger out and let's get a striker in because we are not far off where we want to be. But you've got to back the man and you've got to give him what he wants. Yeah, yeah, well said. And you know, it's it's a. It's a huge debate in itself, isn't it? And that point we'll come on to in just a moment. John, again, Leicester had come to White Hart Lane and put 11 men behind the ball. We're told this time and time again, and yet we don't seem to be able to find an answer, do we? No, I mean, obviously it has been a problem a few times, but I don't think it's limited to... Our problems have not been limited to teams coming and playing that way. I mean, Newcastle had a go at us, didn't they? And, and, you know, we thought if they did come and have a go, we'd pick them off but they beat us they beat us at home as well <laughs> so I think you know when you are one of the say the top half a dozen teams in the league teams are going to come and put you know they're going to put bodies behind the ball and make it difficult but then that that's good management isn't it you're not going to want to go and play like when we played Bournemouth away they had a real go from the very start very first whistle scored in the first minute carried on playing that way didn't try and defend their lead and we scored five past them and I think you know he's just talk and you're talking about especially with Ranieri he's been around you know what I mean he's an experienced manager Poch is still a baby in terms of experience with top level management and I think this is it's a learning curve for him as much as it is any of our players <clears throat> and I just think that you know, we mentioned off air Jace was talking about Townsend and as much as I don't think he is uh, the answer the, f- the thing that that bench lacked both benches really from the last two games is like out and out pace I think it's well, it's alright having you know we could have Charlie Austin on the bench or whoever you know if we'd have signed him in the summer but he's not you're not really going to change the way you're playing bringing on someone like that I think the, the one thing we have not got in the squad is like express pace going forward even in G we was told he had an engine on him but he's not really seen too much of it and now he's injured again so I don't know I think maybe you know, the, the competition for Ericsson, as a, as you've all said, is or the lack of competition could potentially be damaging us. But then he never really had much more competition 
if any, last season when he was pulling out these last-minute winners and what he's got now. But I'm not sure that's really, you know, I'm not sure that that's that's the reason either. But it's just, we are going to have to come up with some, something. I just see from last night, especially, so many aimless balls being hit into the box in terms of crosses. Um, so many long shots being taken by players that end up in the top tier. You know, that's... That's what I see. And, and when you look at those front three behind Kane, there's maybe a reason there we aren't scoring. I mean, Ericsson has, has never, ever been a regular um, scorer other than maybe free kicks, you'd say he's sort of, you know, <coughs> best in the business at. Lamella, yeah, yeah. don't get me wrong, his work rate, Lamella is fantastic. He's been top class in terms of his work rate this season. But in terms of shooting and his goal scoring ratio, it's it's nowhere near up there as, as what it should be for a £30 million player or a player of his age, shall we say. I just think maybe, maybe the difference, and I don't think he's a world beater at all, but maybe the difference has been our lack of Nasser Chadley being at the top of his game so far this season. Mm. And the reason why I say that is because <clears throat> if he's in the team, it means Ericsson's not pushed out on the left. That's the first point. Second point is, last season, between Ericsson, Chadley and Kane, they scored, I think it was 54 goals in all competitions. Obviously, I know Kane got the bulk of those, but Chadley and Ericsson were both in double figures. Mm. And if that's the case, if you've got 50 goals coming from three players, you don't need another 20 goals. Well, it would be Andy, obviously, but it's not like it's imperative that you do have another one who can score 20 or 30 goals. Yeah, and I think, John, we've we've suffered, haven't we, in losing Dembele because losing Dembele, not just are you losing a great player, but it also means that Deli Ali has to work further back than he would like to. When you've got him uh, in as, as part of that front three behind Kane, he's, he's that goal scorer you need. He's that guy with the, an eye for the goal. But when Dembele's not in there, he then has to drop back alongside Dyer, which means he's lo- you lose that that asset don't you and um, you haven't got that side of, of Ali maybe yeah but then it also means that you've got a plan B on the pitch already if you need one one player who I think um, is more of a culprit for that is, is and I'm going to nick one of your lines here John a player who had another brain fart was Kyle Wolf and nearly cost us <laughs> another goal didn't he we, we keep saying don't we about the reason why Rose ain't playing is because Davis has done nothing to be dropped what has Trippier done wrong yep. I don't. Th- he ain't put one, one foot wrong in any game he's played and to be playing one game every six or seven must be quite difficult. John, just to say on that, I do think the argument is, though, that Walker does give you that outlet in terms of his pace. But on your point, I think you're right. I mean, Trippier does offer, um, obviously, the crosses that he puts in, like you, you made your point on. I think he provides a wide variation of crosses in the box. That it's something that we miss. How many times are we saying, get the ball in the box, get the ball in the box? Well, I just so think I the, the other that. thing, it's, it's a different angle to the play as well. You know, Lamella's always going to, if he goes anywhere near the byline, he's going to cut back and he's going to be in, uh, an in-swinger with his left foot. Whereas Trippier gives that out-swinger from the same side of the pitch. And, it, you know, it, we, as we've seen, he is a better crosser than Walker. And I just think that unless you're playing against a left winger who is seriously quick, who's, who you think he's going to have Trippier on toast, there's no reason not to give him a chance now. And I'm, I don't. I'm not. You know. I'm not blaming Carl Walker for anything. I, I do like him, and I, I think he's he's been a much improved for the for the most part this season. But it's another option. You know, it could having Trippier in the team could, like it did against Watford, create if it creates an extra goal or two in tight situations, like we could have done with last night. All right, Walker did score that nice goal against West Ham. But other than that, in the attacking third, I don't think he's done anything else this season. I mean, my final thoughts on, on this one before we move on to transfers, lads, because time's ticking away. I'm sure we could all speak about, the, you know, Leicester all, all night, the Leicester game. I saw some stats with regards to the passing and... Um, Watching the game last night, it seems to be a, another reoccurring theme that we, you know, very comfortable in possession, which is fantastic. But we almost become too comfortable in possession in that we make, we overpass the ball. Um, and what I mean by that is, I think our stats last night, 400 passes I saw on, on Twitter. Well, you know, that's that doesn't mean an absolute jot if you go and lose the game 1-0 you know I'd rather make two passes and, and go and win the game 1-0 um, and I think sometimes we get so worked up with this you know keeping possession pass 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 it's and at times it really does slow us down you'd love almost I think John mentioned earlier about us being a little bit more direct in terms of I think it was maybe Chadley that he mentioned and sometimes you think crikey we've been passing it around in defence there for the best part of what 90 seconds you know that's 90 seconds we could have been going going for the attack and it does seem at times we overpass it and it really does slow us down that's that's just um, my final thoughts on on that 
one. I'll tell you what, lads, let's look at the um, the transfer situation because that's as interesting as anything at the moment. And it sort of links in with the Leicester game because another concern that we were talking about before the podcast was um, Harry Kane and how he's really suffering at the moment. It seems as if he's suffering from that lack of competition. Um, again, another <laughs> reoccurring theme that hasn't been addressed. I think something that all Spurs fans are crying out for at the moment. Lads, we sat here, well, we've sat here on many, many occasions talking about the January transfer window, talking about Daniel Levy saying, please get the business done early. If not, it could cost us. The business hasn't hasn't been done early. Should we be surprised? Maybe not. Jace, with regards to Kane and the striker situation, there are many people out there saying, well, you know, it's January. There's no one available. Who would you bring in, etc., etc.? Is that a good enough excuse for us having not bought in a striker um, since Soldado, I think, was the last striker we bought in? No, there's, there's no, there's no excuse at all because you know there's clearly strikers that we've wanted. Um, I wrote a piece for the for the website last week about Berahino, why why you know we shouldn't fear bringing Berahino in. I think we we deep down we know that's the one that Pochettino's. For, for whatever the reasons, whether we personally think he's the right one, whether I personally think he's the wrong one, whether some of us would want Charlie Austin, whether some of us would want, you know, Neymar or whoever, you know, the realistic one that he's always seemed to identify was Berahino. We waited three months in the summer to do nothing about it until the last week, and then we pushed Jeremy Peace too far. And, you know, for the moment we didn't get him in August, we should have been building the bridges over the last three months because whilst the transfer window's only open in January, you can still be talking to clubs about players from, from September the 1st to December the 31st. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of time to have sorted it out to say to West Brom, what are you looking for from the deal? What This is what we can do. And you should have been doing all of that behind the scenes. And on January the 1st, there should have been the official bid going for them and the deal was done. The, the problem by, you know, if that's the one that Pochettino still wants, part of the time we thought about resting Harry Kane would be for FA Cup games. You've now got a situation where Berahino's played in the FA Cup for West Brom. So even if we signed him today, he now can't play FA Cup games for us. And so Kane has still got to play those games if we're going to try and have a go at the FA Cup. And it is inexcusable why we have not addressed the, the issue. Yeah, I, I just can't fathom how it's something. I mean, even the, I, I think the trust came out, didn't they, in the summer and, and made a, a comment about it because it was, you know, that concerning to supporters that we hadn't addressed the striker situation in the summer. So we're now sitting halfway through the January transfer window and still haven't addressed that situation. You can guarantee, um, give it another week. If we still haven't signed anyone, we'll leave it till deadline day. It then becomes a case of brinkmanship, doesn't it? And um money starts to get thrown around and, and, and prices and, and then games are played and and we all know in some respects that's that's what our chairman likes is, is a few games in that respect. He likes that, that brinksmanship. You know, he has done a great job in many, many respects in terms of pushing through the stadium, in terms of um, getting the NFL deal done, in terms of the the, uh, the training ground. But in so many other respects, there are, there are other ways where he, he holds us back. And so many times when he trips us up, when we're on the brink of something good um, in terms of, let's go back to the Champions League season, you know, the, the signings we made then. Is the right money made available i know managers always come out and say that money's there but is it is it really because you know we, we all know about the 100 million season that went spectacularly wrong we then had a statement from levy to say our our transfer business would be more forget the word now but something to along the lines of um, realistic um which which i know dampened a few ambitions last summer it's just so frustrating because it seems to be a reoccurring theme when we're in a good position and we fluff our lines. Um, Rick, the supporters, as I say, are saying, you know, quite a few Spurs fans out there are saying, well, you know, it's not Levy's fault, which is, which is, is absolutely their right to do so. Um, and they, they would say their argument would be, um, who would you bring in? There's no one out there available. It's January. What's your thoughts on that one? Uh, well, I'm telling you, Andy, that we're, listen, I'm exactly the same as you. Lee, Daniel Levy, make, this no, make no doubt about it, every decision that Daniel Levy takes is in the best interest of the football club. Whether you think that leaving it to the last day is, you know, the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, Daniel Levy believes that every decision he makes for Tottenham Hotspur is in the best interest of the football club. Now, Spurs are a very, very stable club, you know. We're building a stadium. I have no doubt that the stadium we're going to build is probably going to be one of the best stadiums 
if not in London, but in Europe. Mm. Now, having said that, I completely agree with you that there are times where down the seasons, you look back, especially the Champions League season, where he has held us back. And I even go as far as the start of this season. Pochettino, I don't know any other team in the Premier League, the other 19 teams, that are going into the start of the season with one recognised striker. Mm. The issue that we've... I mean, people say, what is there available in January? Sado Berahino, for me, is he's still available. The player is still there. Tony Poulis has had the opportunity already on two press conferences. We're now the 16th of January. He's had the opportunity twice in the space of two weeks to rule out a sale. He hasn't done that. West Brom need the money. Whether you think, like uh, Jace has alluded to, whether you think Berahino's the right player or the wrong player, he's the one that Pochettino wants. Make no doubt about it. He's already alluded to the fact that he needs to sell players before he can buy players. For me, I keep saying it, Berahino, if you're asking me personally, he's the striker that I want. I believe he ticks the boxes what we need. He's English, he's pacey, he's young, he's played with Kane before, he can play in a 4-4-2, he can play in the formation that we play at the moment as a, you know, as a lone striker if Kane isn't around. But Jace makes a valid point that he can't play in the FA Cup. But there's still going to be many games. We've got the Europa League, we've still got the Premier League itself we need to have that option to change a game like last night when it is the 70th minute instead of bringing on no offence an Onoma who may go on to have a great career at Spurs he is not a Premier League experienced striker who knows where the net is we should be bringing on a player that we know has got the ability to change a game and we haven't got that Spurs need to sign a striker that is as far as I go Spurs need to sign a striker and if we don't sign a striker in January it is to Pochettino, what he's done so far is a slap in the face to him because, make no doubt about it, Pochettino is covering Levy at the moment. In terms of when he's being asked, you know, do you not think we need another striker? He's turning around and saying, you know, I believe in the squad. Of course, but he has to say that. Fans need to realise that. Pochettino isn't going to come out and say, I need a striker and I have to have one by the 31st because when the window shuts and we don't get a striker the fans are going to turn on Levy. So he has to be very careful with the way he words it. At the end of the day, every press conference Pochettino has had so far, since the start of the season, even before the window shut at the start of the season, he said we were looking for, you know, the right striker. Berahino is the one he wants. For God's sake, pay the money, bring him in. Tonight we've been linked with Moussa Dembele, the player at Fulham. My argument is that I've already put on social media tonight is that are we really going to risk where we are in the league at the moment? We're fourth in the league. We're seven points off top. Are we going to, just for the fact that it's a cost-effective option, bringing Dembele in, who's a young kid from Fulham with no Premier League experience? Listen, I take into account Deli Ali's progress. We got him in. He has, he's had a fantastic, obviously, effect on us from uh, League One at MK Dons. Are we going to risk bringing in a championship striker who may not hit it off in the Premier League when you've got a player in Berahino? that if you pay the asking price, and that would have lowered from the summer, that he's not going to come in and he's going to score goals. This is a guy who is Premier League experience, knows where the net is, knows players that are already in the Spurs team. All I'm saying is, for God's sake, get the deal done. We need a striker. And if we don't get a striker in January, it is at Levy's door. There's no excuses. The murmurings coming out of White Hart Lane before last night's game from the from the couple of the, the Perhaps the more respected journalists that do seem to, to do seem to reflect Pochettino's views better than than just some of the wild tabloid ones is that they're looking for a striker that can be alongside Kane at times. They're not just looking for a rotation striker. They want one that's capable of playing with Kane, which again suggests that that's that's the Berahino that he wants mm-hmm. because they've played together before. Yeah, I think that would be the perfect match in terms of not just um, in terms of their, their experience, but the height works, doesn't it? You've got the little and large guy, Jace. You've got, you know, the I mean, they're both capable of putting the ball in the back of the net. So it ticks all the boxes all round, doesn't it? Just as you mentioned, the, the concern over the FA Cup, you might argue, well, Pochettino doesn't, you know, rate that competition as, as highly important anyway. So is that is that a big deal? People moaning about Merahino saying, oh, he's not this, he's not that. I mean, it's and his, his attitude and such at West Brom and they're not playing him. It's interesting, isn't it? He came off the bench and scored. And despite the fact he's hardly kicked a ball from all season, he's now their top scorer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um... And they signed Ricky Lamb, but they signed Rondan that they paid, what, 11, 12 million for, which was a lot of money for West Brom. And Berahino is still their top scorer, having played, what, a couple of hours football for them. Mm, yeah. It'd be interesting to, I mean, I haven't, 
it looked into this, but it'd be interesting to look back at the January transfer window as a whole and see um, what transfers clubs have made. And, uh, you know, I think we'll all accept it's difficult to bring in players of the, the highest quality in, in um, January. But you can't tell me that, you know, with the scouting network Spurs have got, that they're not able to bring in a striker that's able to... I mean, even, I think... Would we all accept lads um, bringing in a striker on loan till the end of the season just to act as, as cover, providing he was of the right quality? I'll take anyone right now, Andy. <laughs> I'll take anyone. <laughs> yeah. My worry with Daniel Levy is when we we complain about the Champions League season, he'll take the argument that I brought in Louis Sahar and Ryan Nelson and you did finish fourth. Hmm. It did. It did guarantee us a fourth place finish that season. I think the, the unfortunate the thing, thing is, when, is that's the season that fourth was no longer good enough. <laughs> yeah, third. Well, yeah, I think in that season again, I think Redknapp. You know, I know he's not Spurs fans' favourite, but I think he covered Levy's ass a bit also. But then I think Levy has to also look at himself, Jace, in that. Who who else in their right mind would go and sack a manager who's just got Tottenham Hotspur, <laughs> a club who hasn't played in the Champions League since 1960s, who would go and sack that manager? But the only one thing I'd say about uh, Ricky Ricky said, you know, Daniel Levy always does what's best for Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Yeah. There's that 0.1% of the time where I think he doesn't, where he thinks in terms of commercially. Well, I understand that he wants to grow the brand and all that kind of thing. But Go back to, I think the reason why Harry Kane looks as tired as he does is because he's not had a break for 18 months now. It's not just since the start of the season. He had his first season in top level football last year, obviously smashed it, he'd done really well. Then we had that post-season tour, which was all about making money in the brand of the club. Then he had the under-21s tournament, which went horribly. And, you know, luckily that shaved a couple of games off of that tournament for as far as we're concerned. Maybe not England under-21 supporters, but... And I think that's what it is. And Potts said during that summer, didn't he, that Harry Kane won't start the season because he won't be, you know, he'll be knackered. But he, he and then Daniel Levy let him get, let him down again by not having a striker in place. Mm. And we still haven't got a striker in place. Yeah, absolutely. I think the point you make there about the commercial side is really valid. I, I do though think that Daniel Levy, without even realising it, probably does more damage than he does good by leaving things to the last day and missing out on these players when you know you could be getting these players in pushing up for the champions league you're then by doing that you're growing the brand anyway you know by by improving the club and levy is putting a lot of pressure now on on pochettino to bring through these younger players and as jace mentioned in the previous show it's all well and good bringing through these younger players but they've got to be good enough you know and i i think it's pretty clear the road levy wants to go down now in terms of the policy is rather than bringing a transfer he'd rather see someone come through which is which is fantastic we'd all love that we all there's nothing better than seeing one of our own come through as we've seen in previous years but you can't just rely on that, you know. You well, I think the thing is, we'll we'll see now going forward, especially really from next summer, I would guess, is because that young nucleus is already there. We I don't think we need too many more babies in that squad. Yeah. <clears throat> because then it does, you know, it leans too far on the inexperienced side. Lads, move on to the final section of the show um, and the East Coast talking point, which was thought of last week by John which was a great topic on the most celebrated goals that you remember and I'm sure there's there's ones that we can we can all remember and pick out of the memory bank um, from our Spurs supporting history you don't have to have been at the ground could be on TV I can remember games where I've sprinted out in the garden nearly ended up in the pond and you know all sorts so I'm sure there's there's uh, memories that we've all got out there and you guys out there also sent in quite a few for us uh, John you've got some of those mate I have first one <coughs> <clears throat> C.L. Hendley at C. Hendley 777 Ginola versus Barnsley can't argue that was a great goal fantastic goal Ian Gunn at Coy 64 <coughs> quote marks and still Ricky Villa <laughs> and or Crouch at the Etihad that's another great shout Lee Rainbow Lee Spurs Rainbow Gaza's free kick against that lot in 91 Picked up the Chinese guy next to me and started throwing him around. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sure, the, 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 I'm sure he appreciated that. But <laughs> <laughs> and our very own JC Spurs Thailand. Graham Roberts versus Anderlecht. So late in the final, then Tony Park save. Oh. Also, we've got Gaza free kick again. Hoddle versus Oxford. Danny Rose versus, uh, sorry, Danny Rose volley versus Arsenal and Aaron Lennon versus Chelsea. Yeah, all great, great goals. Some great. I remember my first North London derby, 2006-07 season or 5-6, one or two. We we're 2-1 down. There's, we're in the 93rd minute. Steve Malbronk lays the ball off to Jermaine Genus and the rest is history. I went, 
mental. I nearly died. I kid you not. I was in the shelf upper, and I was sat on the like the three three or four seats which are on top of like where where you come out from the concourse. Yeah. So there was just steps below me, and I jumped in the air, and my mate John, shout out John if you're listening, he caught me. <laughs> I remember saying to him, oh, this lot are going to miss our equaliser. And he just looked at me like, yeah, all right, mate, whatever. <laughs> Nothing better, is there? Nothing better than a great Spurs goal. It don't matter what day, sort of day you're having, um, when that ball hits the back of the net, it all, all seems to change. Jace, you mentioned there the 1984 um, game. Was it a, a stadium job or a TV job for you that night? No, a stadium job. Oh. So my dad, dad took me there and, and, you know, I can remember Robbo scoring and I don't think I saw my dad then until until the penalty shootout had finished. You know, it was the old standing on the shelf in those days. Oh. You know, Dad take me there, getting there four hours before kick-off, trying to get a view. And after after about two minutes of the game, you always got the bloke six foot two standing straight in front of you. You thought, that's it. Now I won't see any of the game. Yeah. So, you know, you're trying to dodge through the crowd and look under people's armpits and things like that. But no, I mean, once uh, it was well, 48, 49,000 in White Hart Lane that night, and just, uh, just a brilliant night. Absolutely. And, a, and obviously a night that brought us a trophy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jace, what was the feeling on the night? Because I know, obviously, it was Birkinshaw's last game. Was it a bit of a bittersweet moment? Oh, um, I think I was too young probably to, to properly understand the implications of Birkinshaw leaving. Um, but I, I think, you know, on the night, we, we actually played really well on the night. And, and Mr. Loader, doesn't that sound familiar? Mr. Loader <laughs> chances. They went down the other end, nicked a goal. And then you thought, right, we're, we're scrambling around here. But I think when Ozzy hit the crossbar, we thought, oh, that's it. And then suddenly the ball came back in. And it was just a night when probably of all the type of people to score, it was a Graham Roberts type character yeah. that got us the goal. But suddenly you thought, right, now we've, we've, we've still got our chance to go and win this. And poor old Danny so Thomas. So that's, that's why it was so big for me. Poor old Danny Thomas. And, um, you know, become quite good friends out here with Gary Stevens, who was part of that side. So, um, oh. you know, there's lots of happy memories and talking back of, of that era with him. What a, what a night, what an occasion. If you, I mean, any Spurs fans who are listening out there, if you haven't had a chance to see it, guys, YouTube it, take a look. What a night. Um, what Art Lane. And when, when you hear about um, European nights at White Hart Lane, when, when you're watching a Spurs game nowadays and they talk about great European nights at the lane, that is what they're talking about. Absolutely brilliant. Rick, any goals that stand out for you in the memory bank? Uh, for myself, I would have to go with the uh, with the Crouch goal, that Champions League goal. I've, I've been sitting here for the last God knows how many podcasts saying that, <laughs> oh, the Cups mean everything, the game's about glory. I don't know, maybe because, I mean, at that time when Crouch scored, I just... We didn't know what Champions League football was. You know, all we were used to is used to hearing the anthem just in the background from other teams. But to have that feeling to think that was coming to White Hart Lane. Yeah. I mean, it was such a... That, I mean, that night, I just remember that night. It was the, probably the most ner- one of the most nervous nights I've ever been a fan. <laughs> and it kind of felt like a cup final in itself. Um, and just that emotion. I mean, I was home watching it uh, with the family. And the moment that ball hit the net from Crouch, it was just... Just scenes, really. Roof just, came off. <laughs> uh, just roof came off. I honestly think the roof did come off. I think everybody in the neighbourhood knew what happened. It was just a wonderful, wonderful moment. And I think people forget Crouch in general. Some of the goals he got, I don't think he gets the credit. You know, uh, the Milan goal, the intimate, you know, the, the, the AC Milan away goal. You know, Crouch, he did score. The, even the young boys' goals, the hat trick that night, you know, we could have been out of the competition. Yeah. The actual out of the Champions League. I mean, people forget that, you know, with Peter Crouch. You know, as much as. Um, People kind of looked at him as being this, you know, this lanky guy and Tottenham playing the long ball and not people liking that. But people forget that he had good feet too. He used to score good goals for us on the ground as well. I mean, you can't, the moments he gave us, you, don't, you shouldn't forget that because I think like many, that will be a moment for young Spurs fans like me. You know, I still never forget that. It was such a special moment. Um, I, I won't forget Crouchy's tackle in Madrid either. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? That's typical Spurs. For that's every, the only time play. he ever made a tackle well, in his life, and he made two in ten minutes. <laughs> there you go, Jack. There you go. For, for every for every great moment, as Spurs as it is, you can find you can find another moment. But um, for me, that Crouch goal was just what a moment. Absolutely, and you mentioned the young boys game there. Of course, we were almost out after the first well, day, weren't we? Four 0 down, Rick. Then came Pavlyuchenko and Crouch saved us, didn't they? 
Yeah, that's what we're saying about Spurs. You know, we always <laughs> love to do it the hard way. But that's my argument this season, Andy. You look at the Cups just very quickly. I mean, there's no guarantee that even getting top four this season is going to mean you're going to be, you know, in the Champions League. You still mm. got to go through that group qualifier and it's getting harder now. It's getting harder. There's no easy tie out there. You know what I mean? So... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what can you What can you say? You know, the cups for me are special, but that crouch goal it was just and that, oh, what a moment! What a moment! Another one for you, lads. Just to finish on, a certain Jurgen Klinsmann scoring at the cop end um, in the FA Cup, and then Teddy finishing off the job. What a moment! Hey, eh? what a moment! And then and then the next round, us uh, messing it all up. Uh, thanks to Daniel Amakachi um, uh, up at I think it was was it. Villa Park, I think we played at that game. It was at, I think, I'm sure it was at Ellen Road. Ellen Road. Ellen Road, Ellen Ellen Road. Road. yeah. was, well, certainly Ellen was. Road. And then, um, yeah, it looked, everyone that year, weren't they, saying Tottenham's name's on the cup. Um, and it looked so good until that game. <laughs> but that is, that is still Spurs to this day. Nothing, <laughs> nothing seems to change. We're That's still why we love 20, them. 20 years down the line and it's still the hope that kills you. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's still the hope that kills you. Absolutely. We wouldn't have it any other way, would we? Um, <laughs> there might be a few out there who might. Listen, lads, it's been a pleasure. Um, and don't forget, guys, you can get in touch with us at E underscore Spurs. We want to hear what you guys think on the uh, games, on the transfer front, on anything you've heard on tonight's show. You can get in touch with the lads you've been listening to on their Twitter account, which we put up every week on our Twitter account at E underscore Spurs. And let us all know what you think of the show and what we've said tonight. We'll be back next week, as always. Other than that, guys, have a great week and come on, you Spurs. Yeah.